We are standing outside of what was the George Washington Carver High School, one of the most significant cultural sites in Arizona. This was the first school in the state built specifically to serve students of color. As one of the last remaining buildings in Phoenix built for African Americans during segregation, this school is a critical piece of history. Good evening, I'm Lydia Curry. And I'm Madison Prowlis. Thank you so much for joining us on this special edition of Cronkite News, where we're celebrating Black History Month. The Carver School closed in 1954 after segregation was outlawed in Arizona. Today, the school is a museum. Its mission is to preserve evidence of the black experience and showcase it for generations to come. There are so many other museums working toward this same goal. I had the opportunity to visit the African American Museum of Southern Arizona to learn how it showcases black history. Well, the museum came to be based on the question of a seven-year-old. After he starts doing his report, he goes, well, museums where you find out history about people, you know. I'm like, yes. He says, well, okay, where's the museum here where I can find people that look like me? I'm like, well, Jody, I don't know. Beverly Elliott is the executive director of the African American History Museum of Southern Arizona, located in the heart of the University of Arizona. The museum opened in January, just in time for Black History Month. That process has been very short compared to most museums, between five and 20 years uh, to really put a museum together. And the Elliott family opened the museum in less than two years. The center focuses on current issues and movements like the Crown Act. We are a movement, not just a museum. We had Ruby Bridges here, a civil rights icon who only went to two places this year, and she picked Tucson, Arizona, so we're very proud of that fact. And then we had Coach Fred Snowden, the first African-American coach in the United States in NCAA Division I basketball, and it was in Tucson. It was at the University of Arizona. Most people want to say Detroit or Chicago or L.A. No, it was here. The museum focuses on black history that is local to Tucson and Arizona. And the museum's kind of curator says she relies on word of mouth from the local black community to collect artifacts and yeah, tell stories. In fact, the first thing that Elliot and her husband did when they secured a space was produce oral histories to be displayed in the museum. We still have, actually we have on the docket right now, 12 more to do and we're going to finish those by the end of March. Oral history has been used to correct previous records of slavery and black history in America. They are also extremely important to community-driven archives like the African American Museum of Southern Arizona. And our community wants their stories and the stories of their families to be told. Lydia Curry, Cronkite News, Phoenix. The Carver School laid the foundation for so many students who went on to create incredible things. They're a part of a long history of black inventors who have made tremendous impacts on the world around us. Cronkite News reporter Sidney Witte introduces us to an inventor who saved countless lives, and his work is on display right here in the Valley. The smoke hood, the traffic light, both created by black inventor and entrepreneur Garrett Morgan. One of his first life-changing inventions was the smoke hood. One of the last four known is at the Hall of Flames in Phoenix. A long tube, long hose that went down to the floor, it was filtered, and as long as there was at least a little bit of air down near the floor, you could stay in that smoke-filled environment as long as you need to. Although it was proven to work, his biggest challenge was selling his invention as a black man. His granddaughter Sandra Morgan explains how her grandfather's white colleagues posed as him to sell it. He knew that if he went, he'd be thrown out on his ear. So he, you know, contracted with a client or with an, uh, a colleague to go with him to the safety exposition. They presented themselves as Garrett Morgan, and he went as Big Chief Mason. And so he went as the assistant. The smoke hood became a prominent piece of equipment after he used it to rescue workers during the 1916 waterworks disaster at Lake Erie. It proved definitively that the gas mask worked. The unfortunate part was that Garrett Morgan did not receive the recognition that he deserved. Ultimately, even though his picture was on the front page of the newspaper, um, you know, carrying bodies out, uh, he was not acknowledged as being a part of the a part of the uh, rescue. 
team. A few years later, after Morgan witnessed numerous car accidents, he also invented the three-color traffic light that we know today. He added the all-stop feature, and he got a patent on that in the 1920s, and that eventually sort of became the yellow light. So when you see a yellow light, you can think of Garrett Morgan also. That's not the only thing at the Hall of Flames that has a connection to black history like this water tower that was owned by an all-black fire station. In its early days, particularly, was assigned to Station 11 in Toledo, Ohio, which in those days uh, was an all-black, all-African-American uh, fire station. At the Hall of Flames, the Smoke Hood and Big Bertha represent innovations from the black community. Sandra Morgan is thankful that her grandfather finally gets his recognition. He was smart, he was curious, he was innovative. More than that, um, he was interested in public safety and he was looking out for everyone, not just African Americans or not just Americans, but, you know, global public safety. In Phoenix, Sydney Witte, Cronkite News. So much of the history here is tied to civic engagement. The Carver School itself was founded to push for better education with students of color. And that's just one example of activism that defines Phoenix history. I recently went to an art installation where we explored the different figures in a recent movement. A nation that forgets its past has no future. How do you think this art installation best captures the movement? These portraits are so human. What this exhibit tries to do, I think, is help you understand the reality behind life as a black Arizonan and why people were out that day. I saw so many of the statements starting with the words I am. What was the decision behind choosing that and having that as the main name for the art installation? This idea started to put the humanity back in to the protest movement and that was what inspired this project, I Am. They were asked to complete I Am statements to reflect on their life as a black American. Before these portraits were taken, they completed these I Am statements. And then as these portraits were taken, the photographer read out some of these responses to them and captured their reactions. This pairing of portraits, very powerful. You're met with this young woman with tears in her eyes as she hears these I am statements read back to her. Below her, you see a gentleman who has tattoos of tears running down his face. Could you talk a little bit about what your favorite protest photo is on this wall? What this image captures is the moment right after protesters threw fake blood on the monument. We can see it dripping down our state and on to this saying underneath, a nation that forgets its past has no future. Seeing that image of a Confederate monument covered in fake blood, uh, talking about the past while simultaneously surrounded by this torso that lists the names of some of the victims of police brutality, I think is a, a powerful statement um, that shows that Arizona is a part of this story. Can you talk to me a little bit about what is in the glass case there? It's a t-shirt and a face mask from a vigil held in Tucson um, in early June of 2020 to remember George Floyd. We want to represent for the future generations what those protests were like Looking around, I'm seeing a lot of the same photo reoccurring throughout. Talk to me a little bit about that photo. It was actually taken during the summer of 2020. It represents all of the violence against black bodies that keeps happening. These are the names that we do know, but maybe the headless torso represents all of the individuals that we don't know hence the repetition. Could you talk a little bit about the process of gathering those quotes? Over 100 people participated in this project. If anyone is interested in um, exploring all of the I am statements, we have a booklet that contains all of the I am statements, every single one. What impact 
do you want people to take away from this exhibit as a whole and for future generations to inspire them? All of the portraits here are either activists or allies of the Black Lives Matter movement. Take the time, look at these faces, read these statements, think about the human beings saying these statements. When we come back, how historic mistrust in the medical profession contributes to a higher rate of Alzheimer's in Black men. Plus, the Phoenix Sun's long history of shining light on Black culture. Now on Passport. What are you looking for in your life? There's an important story that needs to be told. Is it a sense of your own destiny? Choose your story. Try to help create change in some way. It's a beautiful thing. Not very many people get to see. Once you come into the neighborhood, you are a part of the family. You can be a good person or a bad person. It's your choice. Stop complaining and go actually do something. Now you can stream even more documentaries with Passport on the PBS Video app. Hello, I'm Adrian Farewell, and I'm proud to serve as General Manager of Arizona PBS. From Phoenix to the Grand Canyon, Flagstaff to Prescott, and everywhere in between, this station is the best way to remain connected to all that's going on in our beautiful state. So whether you're interested in arts, culture, and music, to local politics and education, we've got you covered. You're watching Arizona PBS, and your Arizona connection starts right here. My heart is racing right now. Fasten your seatbelt. You're uncovering the truth. These are consequential things. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look at everybody. <gasps> I feel the presence of all these people. I've got history. <laughs> no. I wish my ma could be here to see this. Amazing. It's like the most vital stuff, right? Tuesdays on Arizona PBS. The Carver School placed a large focus on things like science labs and STEM education, and because of that, some of the students ended up being trailblazers in healthcare. But even today, there is still a distrust in the medical profession within black communities. Cronkite News reporter Maria Stobbs explains how the distrust may be leading to a higher rate of Alzheimer's. More than 150,000 Arizonans are living with Alzheimer's disease, according to the latest Alzheimer's Association report. We're an epicenter for this disease. We have the fastest growth rate of Alzheimer's in the country. The same report shows that older Black Americans face a higher risk. If you look at the numbers, the impact of Alzheimer's in Black communities, it's double that in Black men versus Caucasian men. African Americans also tend to be diagnosed at a later stage of Alzheimer's disease. So I think there's a number of reasons why people don't get diagnosed at an earlier stage. One is just general lack of awareness of what the early warning signs are, what to look for. Another piece of this is really, are we having black men be a part of the research? Are they leading research teams? Nearly two thirds of black Americans believe that medical research is biased against people of color contributing to a lack of trust surrounding clinical trials. It's much easier to build the trust when you have someone in the seat that looks like you, that's providing the care to you. Members in the community like Anthony Gathers, a longtime barber at AG's Barbershop, are hoping to help build that trust and increase early detection of Alzheimer's. Traditionally in the black barbershop, it's always been a trust. When you have that trust, if a person is scared to go, we can basically say, hey, I'm taking you and that's what it is. According to the Alzheimer's Association, 69% of African Americans do not want to participate in a clinical trial because they fear being a guinea pig. A documented history of exclusion from medical trials and discrimination contributes to this fear. They talk about, oh, they might put something in me I don't need and I'll be an experiment. So that trust still weighs in our community, but we'll assure them that that's not what it is and we'll send them to the place that will 
be able to take care of them. Gathers provides educational brochures and resources to his customers. We can get ahead of it, we can educate each other, and we can be a better community within the black community. The shop also partners with Black Nurses Association for free blood pressure checks and other programs to provide for its customers. In Phoenix, Maria Stobbs, Cronkite News. Black history is deeply rooted in the world of sports, from Jesse Owens to Jackie Robinson. And sports teams, like the Phoenix Suns, are doing their part to champion members of the community, not only this month, but all year round. Black History Month is one of the many times during the year in which black historical figures are highlighted by paving the way for future generations. The Phoenix Suns are highlighting black excellence by focusing on black owned businesses, shining light on Avery and Turner, Turner is the owner of Humble Clothing Company here in Phoenix. The Suns kicked off a celebration for Black History Month that Turner describes as a dream. For me to be honored for the, the first day of Black History Month is, is like, it's a dream come true, to be real with you. Like, I really, like, I, I've been doing this so long for, for 14 plus years, I've been doing this. And for me to get recognized, it's just a dream come true. And, I, and I'm just, I tell you, like I say, I'm ecstatic. I'm, 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 a, I'm lost for words. Turner is the Suns recipient of the Black Excellence Award, an award in partnership with First Bank that recognizes Black-owned small businesses in Arizona. The Suns have a long history of shining a light on African-American culture in the community. In previous years, the Suns Legacy Partners have worked with the Black History Month Mural Project to feature prominent African-American figures with the I Am Black History Month mural. For Suns player Ish Wainwright, the celebration of Black History Month represents growth. It just shows that how far the world has come, you know. Um, this is Black History Month, of course, this is, you know, a month for uh, just pioneers of, you know, America, African-Americans. Um, but it's just a blessing to be able to be a part of it. You know, I'm pretty sure we're going to do some things as a team. Um, and also as a player, I'm pretty sure we're going to, you know, wear our shoes and, you know, show those off. So. Um, it's a blessing to be a part of. Whether it's through art or community recognition, the Suns have implemented many ways to represent the different people and cultures who make up the community, an act that doesn't go unnoticed to Turner. Well, well, you got to respect that, you know, that they, they even want to do things like that. I mean, their platform, they have a big platform. So for them to, to put, you know, different people, you know, especially like me coming from where I come from, which, you know, which is south side of Phoenix, uh, for them to recognize us, um, you got to respect that because they don't have to. Even though the Suns were on the road for most of February, the team has displayed pride in Black History Month through the gear they are wearing. As they remind the world, much has been built by Black History. You see on the shirts, the game of basketball has been built by Black History. Uh, truth be told, a lot of things in this world have been built by Black History, so let's never forget that. Now, to a lesser known history of Black athletes the Black Rodeo. The depiction of the American cowboy has mostly excluded African Americans in popular culture, yet they have a rich tradition in the American West and in the sport of rodeo that's paved the way for today's riders. Here's Emily Bernstein with the story of a five-year-old barrel racer. Steering a 1,200-pound horse around tight turns at high speed is no easy feat. But for someone whose five-year-old feet swim in the stirrup, it would seem nearly impossible. Skylar Brandon has been bumping up and down in a saddle before she could walk. She went to the first black rodeo in Oakland and her grandmother brought her to the rodeo. And she was the only kid that just locked in and did not move and watched the entire rodeo. So we knew something was there. Out of the saddle, she's a little shy. Like this guy, I'm a five-year-old barrel racer. But when she's racing around the barrels, she's another person. She's, she's just into it, you know, like it excites her. You know, I see her coming out of her shell when she's on, on the horse compared to when she's off the horse. So I think it gives her like a bit of freedom and just, you know, she becomes herself more when she's riding. It doesn't hurt that her best friend is along for every ride. I love him when my best friend's riding. Quarter horses make the best barrel racers for their agility and spirit. Skylar's trainer has her riding on this Peruvian mare named Charlene for her safety till she's strong enough to ride a quarter horse. There's a bit of anxiety initially when she first takes off and then I see that she has control of everything and I kind of calm down a little bit, but always seeing her smile. Skylar is competing against girls two and three times her age and twice her size. I don't think her being so small affects what she's doing. She's learning at a slow pace, learning the right way. 
and the sight of this kindergartner and her horse kicking up the arena dirt may just encourage others to throw their hat in the ring. I think now when other kids see a five-year-old riding, um, they're inspired to try it, even adults. They see a small kid controlling a horse that way, maybe I can do it too. From the dirt at Westworld in Scottsdale, <laughs> Emily Bernstein, Cronkite News. The Arizona Black Rodeo plans to return to Westworld in Scottsdale in 2023 over Labor Day weekend. Still ahead on Cronkite News, artists throughout the valley are preserving and documenting the black experience through their work. Now streaming on the PBS app, the definitive collection of documentaries from award-winning filmmaker Ken Burns. Hemingway, the man, is much more interesting than the myth. It is a story that Americans have to reckon with. He's got my job, I'm the town. Discover over 40 groundbreaking films that bring our history to life. Stream the Ken Burns collection now with Passport on the PBS app. This is Phoenix. For over the past 60 years, Arizona PBS has told incredible stories of Arizona's distinctive people, beautiful landscapes, and treasured history. Now relive those memories we've pulled from The Vault. From The Vault is a compendium of the best local PBS programming has to offer. It's fun, it's history, it's you. From The Vault. I'm Adrienne Farewell, General Manager of Arizona PBS. We've got so much going on here at the station. I'm Catherine Anaya. I'm Alberto Rios. I'm Chef Mark Tarbell. I'm Ted Simons. We want everyone to know that their Arizona connection starts right here at Arizona PBS. For over the past 60 years, Arizona PBS has told incredible stories of Arizona's distinctive people. We got to start being more vulnerable with each other. What I love most about being a Latina woman is the passion and drive that I feel. Beautiful landscapes and treasured history. We're doing something that benefits the community. Good evening and welcome to Orizante. Welcome to Check, Please, Arizona. Welcome to the U.S. Senate debate. The recipient of the Emmy is... Arizona PBS. These sculptures are a tribute to four black girls killed in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. The artwork is meant to preserve black history through creativity and expression. It's a task that many black artists here in the Valley are working towards as well. Cronkite News reporter Yuri Han shares their stories. The summer of 2020 gave me more motivation to like really talk about those things and kind of get some insight. Um, but it definitely made me want to be more of a professional artist and, and take that title also. So, Aaron Marner's paintings show a personal story of certain moments in life, specifically in remembrance of his mother. She kind of passed away um, suddenly. And it's weird because I incorporated these hearts and things into the work, um, not knowing how my mother actually passed away, but it's specifically about kind of letting her go because I've had a hard time with that. Marner says he thinks Black History Month is more a celebration of Black and African culture, and he hopes society gets to a point where culture is more focused and acts like a melting pot. More just like a month where I think people who are creative and work, or who are African American Black get to you know, express themselves and are highlighted for some of the things they do. Rhonda Carter is a visual artist in Avondale, Arizona. She works on her pieces from home in this makeshift studio. This is my messy cabinet with all this junk in it. <laughs> all the stuff I love. So basically, this is a piece I'm working on and it's not ah uh, complete. I'm still undecided on the face. One current piece she's working on has a direct connection to black history. So I have this piece that's kind of looking like Harriet Tubman, sort of, uh, it's about this size. And she's like running to get to freedom. And it kind of feels like 
that still we we're fighting for freedom. Rhonda says this month is pertinent to what she believes is still a fight for her people. People get the chance to be more uh, ethnically aware, like all of us, you know, and it uh, puts an emphasis on the many things that we've contributed to America. While Rhonda gets her inspirations from historical figures like Harriet Tubman for her art pieces, Gideon gets his inspirations from stones. See, what he'll do is he'll look at a stone and think of a vision in his head, and then he'll start carving and shaping it to fit his image. Here, as you can see, it's a right, just like a stone. But look, hello, it has life in it. I wanted to bring that life, and I could see the spirit of wisdom. Gideon Nihongo is a stone sculpture from Zimbabwe. He says every piece of art is a representation of love, family, and life. Us as black people here in America are represented as well by the ego itself. During the times back then, if you go deep into the history, the ego used to sing to give a sign of certain things or certain things which were going to come. And we respect that and we love to embrace it. Three perspectives of a culture as unique and varied as they are. In Phoenix, Yuri Han, Cronkite News. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of Cronkite News as we celebrate Black History Month. For more on our stories and learn about preservation efforts, visit cronkitenews.azpbs.org.